just pick a spot on our body where we can feel the sensation of the breath as it goes through its cycle of coming in and going out. And just letting our attention rest there. And each time the attention wanders and loses the object, when we notice that, we just bring it back again. And do that again and again. And then we think about why we're here together today, what we want to get out of this. And we try to make our goal, our aspiration as broad as possible. And we think, may we be here not just for the sake of the hour and a half that we have, but may whatever good we may derive from this, may it ripple out from there farther, much farther. May it ripple not only into happiness for ourselves in the future, in this life, not only into happiness for ourselves in the future, in future lives, if we think in those terms, not only in our ability to overcome all our problems, but may whatever we do here today be a seed that will ultimately lead to further seeds, further seeds that will grow to our being able to help every being everywhere so that wherever there's suffering, we can remove it. Wherever there's a want for happiness, we can accomplish it maximally. And so with that motivation, with that intention, we can do everything we do today, starting with opening our eyes if they're closed. And talking. All right. Very nice to see you all. So today I thought we could talk a little bit about, let me just fix this. Um, the, the Buddhist methods for analyzing the truth, right? So, so here's, here's what we've talked about so far the last few weeks. We've talked about um, what is Buddhism? Is Buddhism a religion? How, what does Buddhism have to say about faith? The different ways that the different things in Buddhism that in English we might call faith and how Buddhism relates differently to them. Um, we were talking about how to be a wise student, how to let the truth uh, change our entire mental structure. It's not, not bad for three weeks, right? Uh, and we we started to talk about you know we talked about how in order for the truth to change our entire mental structure we need four things we need um we need to i'm gonna i'm gonna say them in a different order we need to clear away the obstacles that might be preventing us from making progress we need to generate the the positive energy the positive potential that will propel us towards being able to change. We need to be inspired, 
by 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 a living example that that can make us almost taste the possibility of change and we need to do what we call develop the three wisdoms right and then three wisdoms the first one is the wisdom of learning is making sure that we're understanding what the hypothesis is then the wisdom of um investigating right which is establishing the what the truth or falsity of the hypothesis, like establishing either the truth of the hypothesis or the truth of the opposite of the hypothesis, right? Um, until we have a, a, a firm conviction, and then the wisdom of accustoming the mind or habituating the mind or familiarizing the mind by just really letting the mind become, um, just letting the mind marinate on that conviction once we have it um, until until that becomes the natural kind of uh, viewpoint that the mind starts from. And, and so uh, in all of that, one of the steps is, like we said, developing the, the wisdom of investigating. And so we could ask, well, how do we go about that? How can we develop certainty? How can we develop conviction? in something um, where simultaneously our conviction becomes unshakable, but also we're not at risk of be, have developing unshakable conviction in something wrong, in something mistaken, right? Does that seem like a, like a useful question? <laughs> okay, good, <laughs> good. Um, One, one, one helpful thing, I think, to, to maybe take some of the pressure off from a prospect like that is that from a Buddhist point of view, it's impossible to develop truly, like finally, unshakable conviction in something incorrect, because the evidence will always be there to prove us wrong. If something's wrong, and as long as we're willing to find out, as long as we're willing to see you know, to check the evidence and to go with it, then we, we can we can be mistaken, but not, you know, irremediably, like not unhelpably so forever. On the other hand, and this this is interesting, this is the saving grace of the whole system, that if we develop an unshakable conviction in something that is true, that can be irreversible, because there will never be any evidence that will suggest otherwise because it's it's true right anyway um anyway like uh, there's more that could be said but but let's leave that there so to to think about like in buddhism how how can we how can we investigate stuff to, to develop certainty? Now, now, first of all, the real answer is to do whatever works that is reliable, you know? Um, so there's no there's no prescription, there's no, I mean, there's no proscription, there's no like, but you mustn't do use this method, or you're not allowed to do this, or you or even pre, like you have to do this. Uh, anything that's reliable. Uh, and works is is fair game. Buddhism cautions us though to be careful about things that aren't reliable. Um, like we talked about the Kalama Sutra, Buddha kind of warned against all of these things that aren't reliable. Like don't go by like uh, just like popular wisdom of what people think right now. Don't go by um, just because the teacher said so um don't go by like feels intuitively right you know like that stuff is tricky um so there's this concept in in uh indian philosophy in, so including buddhism but but even broader than buddhism what, what we're talking about now is what uh in the west we call epistemology 
epistemology is um, it's the field of, of philosophy that studies what do we know and how do we know that we know it? You know, how do we know that we're not mistaken? And in, in India has a very, very uh, sophisticated developed tradition of epistemology. And um, in India, they have a concept of something called a, a pramana. Just if you're curious, it's P R A M as in Mary, A N as in Nancy, A pramana. And a pramana, even though each school of philosophy might kind of give a slightly different definition of it, a pramana, everybody agrees, is a, a reliable way of knowing something. It's, it's basically what, like any epistemology pretty much is probably seeking that, whether we think of it in those terms or not. What's a reliable way of knowing something? And the different traditions will define different ways of knowing things in different ways. And out of the different ways that we can know something, it will say out of that set, these are pramanas, these are reliable, these are authoritative. So for example, some ways that we could know something is we hear somebody say it. That's one way that we could know. Um, I don't know of any tradition that would consider that to be a pramana. You know, Another way that we could know something is it is written in a holy text, right? Um, I think some Western religions probably would consider that to be pramana if they thought about it in those terms. Certainly some Indian uh, philosophical traditions would consider that to be pramana. Buddhism says that is not pramana. Like you could read something in a holy text and the holy text could be wrong, you know? Um, uh, analogy would be, is a way that some Indian traditions consider, uh, that we can know something that some Indian tradi traditions consider to be pramana, like, you know, like, well, this and this is true when it comes to sheep, so it must also be true when it comes to goats, you know? Buddhism says that's not pramana. It, you know, there could be a difference between sheep and goats that you're not picking up on, right? And so on and so on. So out of all of the different ways that we can know things, Buddhism considers only two of them to be pramanas, only two. The first one is direct, unmistaken experience. So that means... Like you, you see something for yourself when you have your glasses on and you haven't just taken drugs, you know, and the lights are good, right? And, and I'm giving you, again, I'm giving you just like the, the flavor of it, like just the, the intro flavor of it. Like th there's tremendous amount of detail in how to make sure that the, that the um, perception isn't distorted, you know? How do you know that you're not hallucinating? How do you know that you're not, mistaken what you're seeing and, there, and and it's remarkable how much you can do with that so seeing something here like if you see something then you can know that you saw it. if you hear something you can know that you heard it and so on and so forth um the other way of the other pramana is um what we would call perhaps like a perfect, and the word perfect there is, is crucial, a perfect logical inference, all right? We're not talking about just like reasoning generally. We're not talking about like, well, if you think about it, this must be that, you know, like, I mean, can you think of another way? Like, you know, we're not talking about that type of reasoning. We're talking about a lot like syllogistic logic, you know, like if A, then B, A, therefore B, right? That's how we can know things like every triangle without exception has three sides. You know, you don't need to see for yourself. You don't need to go do a poll and look at all of the triangles or ask all the mathematicians. Anyone in this room, if we know the definition of triangle, we can know with absolute certainty and conviction that you'll never, ever, ever, ever come across a triangle that has a different number of sides than three, right? I mean, I tell me, tell me if I'm going too much into the weeds, right? Because I, I'm, I love this stuff. I'm very passionate about this. So if you let me go, I'll, I'll just go. But um, I just want to show you that there's a big difference between that 
and what's called inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is like people until the 1600s in uh, Europe, people used to think that all swans were white, right? And so people might have been going around saying, we will never, ever, ever come across a swan that isn't white, right? And then lo and behold, they discovered Australia. They discovered Australia from their perspective, and there are black swans, right? And, and everybody kind of lost it because it's like, how do we know anything? The way that people knew, quote unquote, that all swans were white has nothing to do with logic. It's called induction. It's like, well, I've never seen a black swan. Have you? No, okay, then all swans are white. That's not reliable. That's something else, right? Very, very different from knowing that all triangles have three sides. It's not because I've never come across a triangle of a different side, have you? It's not that, it's totally different. We can know that no triangle has a different number of sides than three. We can know that no matter how many people you meet on whatever planets, you'll never, ever, ever meet a married bachelor, ever, right? <laughs> That's logic, as Lewis Carroll would say. Um, now, it's remarkable when you really study this stuff. And, and even, even what I've said so far, you know, right now I'm putting them out there as suggestions. Even that's to be investigated. Like, you know, like, why can't you trust other things but those two? And how do you know that, we can, that you can, can always trust your senses? And how do you know that you can always trust? Uh, logic and so forth. And those are to, to, to the extent that <laughs> um, to the extent that you want to develop just an absolute conviction in something, those are very important questions, right? And, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of very detailed, very um, sophisticated and, and frankly, I, I find like very beautiful work in Buddhism on that. Um, And what's remarkable is with just those two things, the, what are all the things that we can know that at first sight we must, must, might think like, well, no, we couldn't possibly know that through direct experience and deduction. Um, it, it's just, it's really, I mean, I, maybe I'm just projecting from my, myself, but my own experience, I was very surprised. I was very surprised. Like there, there would be claims that I'd say like, well, I mean, that claim can't be arrived at from here. But that I think I think it can. I think it can, like things like rebirth and things like that, for example. Um, now, that does raise, I think, a, a very interesting question, which is, I would guess, like at the heart of a lot of the conceptual difficulties that a lot of us in the West might have with Buddhism, like when it comes to things like rebirth and karma, like that to us, like we hear that as religious stuff, because in our tradition, the only talk there ever is about what happens after we die is in religion, you know? So, so we hear that as a religious question. And I think we tend to hear religious questions as coming down to faith in something, in somebody, and so I, I, I don't know, maybe I, I should just speak for myself, but I think for me at first, like it was very hard to even, if I'm being totally honest, like to even like open my mind to the idea that there could be a way of discussing the stuff that wasn't down to faith, you know? Um, but to ask the question even more broadly, you could say, what about things you know, are, aren't there things that we can't ascertain for ourselves? Aren't there things that we can't know for ourselves? And here, we, I, I, I think it's helpful to introduce another concept in Buddhism, which is there, in Buddhism, if you take all phenomena, like all things that exist, and that includes not just objects, but also like facts, you know? So like two plus two equals four would be a phenomenon. You know, my phone would be a phenomenon. So if you take all phenomena, there are many ways to divide them, but one way to divide them is you can divide them into three types, three types of phenomena. The first type of phenomenon can be called 
manifest phenomena or obvious phenomena. The second kind can be called hidden phenomena or slightly hidden phenomena. And the third kind is called very hidden phenomena. All right. So manifest phenomena or obvious phenomena, by definition, those are the things that you can directly experience with your senses. Um, so like my phone and my phone's presence here, both of those are manifest phenomena to me right now. I can tell, I can see. Hidden phenomena or slightly hidden phenomena, those are things that you're sent, they're not accessible to the senses, but they are accessible to perfect logic, to perfect uh, deductive reasoning. Um, like, just as a casual example, I think I could say for all of you right now, the fact that my phone exists somewhere outside of the screen, right? You, you can't see that directly, but you can know that, right? And then the third one, very hidden phenomena. These are things that we can neither experience directly, nor that we can, um, nor that we can deduce with perfect reasoning, okay? An example, the classic example of that is our birthday like for each of us, our own birthday, right? We can't, like, if, if I'm wondering when is my birthday, you know, what, what it says on my birth certificate, is that true? I mean, my grandmother, um, who just passed away, she, uh, her birth certificate said one thing, but her birthday was something else uh, for, for a clerical reason. Basically, my great-grandfather uh, didn't take her to get her birth certificate in within a certain time frame, so he would have to pay a fine for having delayed. So he just said, oh, she was born more recently than that. Um, so she's like the queen, she was like the queen of England, you know, she had an official birthday, but a real birthday. And so, so who knows, like maybe, maybe my parents had the same thing happen. Like maybe what it says on my birth certificate isn't true. So how do I know, right? Well, there's nothing I can look at or see that can establish that. And at least as of right now, there's no perfect method of um, flawless inference that could help me arrive at a, at a date, right? I mean, you could cut me in half and count the rings, but that will only give you an approximate estimation, I guess. I don't know. Um, so so there's, there's an interesting piece of tension here. We're saying there are certain things, there are three types of phenomena, but there are only two pramanas, right? So what do we do? What do we do? Before we talk about um, what to do, one important thing to recognize in that is that what type of phenomenon something is, is relative to a certain person at a certain time, right? My phone be, being in this room with me right now is a, is a slightly hidden phenomenon to you, but it's a manifest phenomenon to me. I see it. I mean, you have to take my word for it, but I do see it, you know? My phone's existence, right? My phone's existence is a slightly hidden phenomenon to you right now. It's a manifest phenomenon to you right now. It's a slightly hidden phenomenon to you right now. Follow? Right? Um, DNA is a very hidden phenomenon for me right now. Um, I, I, I certainly believe it exists. <laughs> I have what I think is good reason to think it exists, but I can either see it directly, nor can I like deduce it through perfect reasoning, right? Ditto for black holes, ditto for microbes, right? But they are not necessarily in, in, in fact, I, I, I bet my money that they're not very hidden to all humans at all times. You know, presumably you could look under a microscope and have a direct experience of uh, DNA strands. You know, and in that moment, it becomes a manifest phenomenon to that person. Another example of what's considered to be um, a, a, a very hidden phenomenon 
is the particular results of karmic actions if they exist right like what like i just i just engage in a karmic action what will be the exact experience that i'll have as a result of that extremely hidden phenomenon i can neither see that nor can i deduce that there are far too many variables at play just far 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 too many variables at play right and vice versa i just had this experience what specifically did i do in a previous rebirth and when that was the karmic cause of this extremely hidden phenomenon there's just no way of, of knowing that um for me right now with with the apparatus that i have right I can know it in a general way. Like if, if I were to take a whole bunch of rice and cut my hands, a whole bunch of grains of rice, like dry rice and put a, a little number on each one of them so that they're all like, you know, I did like defined as individuals, you know, grain number one, grain number two. Grain number three. If I throw all the rice in the air, some of them, some grains will land there, some will land there, some will, grain, some will land here, right? And if you were to ask me, why is it that grain number 17 landed exactly where it landed as opposed to just a little bit this way or just a little bit that way that's a that's a very hidden phenomenon to me like i have no idea but i could tell you in general you know like what accounts for the way that they landed you know like well they landed a little bit more to the left because there's a breeze that's Put, you know, facing that way and, and the force that I used up and I could give you a rough idea that's only slightly hidden to me, but the specific details that's very hidden to me, but there is a reason, you know, that there is a reason I can know what exactly the reason is. I can't not without a supercomputer of some kind. And, um, I, I want to say just a few thing, things more about this before uh, before I open up to questions. But one, one thing I just want to say is, I, I just want to point out that the details of karma is, is typically given as an example of a very hidden phenomenon. But rebirth is considered only a slightly hidden phenomenon. Rebirth is not something that you can't really know. Like that rebirth exists is considered to be only a slightly hidden phenomenon. You can you can read the evidence proposed and you can check it out for yourself, right? And the evidence proposed, I don't mean in terms of like people who remember past lives, that, that can be uh, persuasive, I guess, on, on a rhetorical level, like on an emotional level, but I don't think that that's a perfect proof necessarily. Um, but in any case, um now another thing that we can do yeah let, let me just yeah i'm just thinking let me before i ask for questions let me just say a couple more things because this might answer some potential questions i think um i, I said another thing that we might do but that's not that's not what i mean i guess what i mean is what i mean to say is so so what about the very hidden phenomena like how, how how can we relate to those right well um most of the time the good news is it doesn't matter <laughs> you know like uh, what should i do about the fact that i don't know why this particular grain of rice landed here i think you should just make peace with it is my advice anyway like it's okay like it's okay <laughs> there's only so much time that we have and uh, um but what about if there's something that is really important to you that will kind of like alter your choices in life that's inaccessible to you right now and i'll go so far as to say that if you haven't I don't know, I don't know if this would be technically true according to the definitions, but for at least, you know, uh, for practical purposes right now, I'll say that if you don't have, if you haven't accessed any of the um, 
evidence that establishes rebirth and so on to you right now maybe rebirth might be the existence or non-existence of rebirth might be a very hidden phenomenon perhaps right at least functionally right now um and it might perhaps be one that you might say would really alter your way of seeing the world your choices your this your that yeah. so if there is something important that is very hidden to you right now, what can you do? So there's there's a couple of things you can do. One is that you can um, basically what I'm gonna call like develop new technologies to make very hidden phenomena become manifest. Um, this is done all the time in the West. This is done all the time in India. It's just in two different ways. In the West, we do that with uh, things like telescopes, uh, microscopes, MRI machines, CAT scan machines, X-ray machines, all sorts of things like that. That you know, before before those machines existed, um, you know, something like a virus was an extremely hidden phenomenon. But now, you know, to somebody who's looking through a microscope, a virus is a manifest phenomenon. So that's one way to do it. In India, and this isn't just in Buddhism either. In India. They have, um, they've done something similar with um, mental, what I, what I would call like mental technologies. You know, just like we can't see certain physical things with the naked eye. And so we develop certain physical instruments to allow us to see them directly physically. In the same way, we can't perceive certain mental phenomena that are currently there with the naked eye, you know, like without any extra anything. And so there are mental tools that have been developed in India before the time of the Buddha that do allow us to see that stuff. Um, so some, some of the mental tools are things like um, samadhi, which is um, effortless and interrupted perfect concentration, um, which is something that, I guess the thing with like a microscope, just by virtue of it being physical, is that somebody else can learn how to build a microscope tell that to a second party who then builds it in their factory. And then they just hand it to you. And as long as somebody tells you how to use it, you're good. Like you don't have to build a microscope for yourself, right? But with the mental tools, just because the mind is a first person thing, there's, there's nothing for it. We each have to build it for ourselves. There are instructions on how to do it, but uh, we're the factory. So it takes, it takes uh, a lot of work. It takes a lot of work, but you can build. Um, Samadhi, I said, then there's, then there's, then there's, all right, then there's um, shamatha, which is, um, which is just kind of like a, a, for a further development. Once you have developed samadhi, like it says samadhi plus Sorry, sorry. Samadhi plus, like a, it's this exhilarating sense of mental and physical fitness that you're knowing that you're able to concentrate on anything for as long as you wish. Um, then there's uh, vipassana, which is um, it, it, each of these is building on the last, right? It's like you take shamatha and you add to that, like this exhilarating sense of fitness that you can discern and understand fully all the subtle details of anything. And, and these are all things that um the instructions are, are there they're very very precise um and all the troubleshooting instructions are there too and that allows us to to transform things that are currently very hidden phenomena in the mental realm into manifest phenomena and it's very interesting how um how western science in, in getting at these things from a different angle has also backed up some of these claims, like, for example, um, since time immemorial, it's been said that if you do develop perfect concentration, then you can notice things that happen so quickly that nobody else will notice them, right? And, and uh, studies in, in Western labs have now, you know, confirmed this, um, that if you flash a word on the screen for a certain length of time and you ask the person what's the word that we just flashed on the screen uh people will get it right but if you make it faster and faster there's a certain threshold that it was said that no human being could exceed because based on experience based on induction right i, I don't remember but let's say like if it's less than one eighth of a second let's say 
then then you flash a word on the screen and the person says i have no idea and shorter than that the person says i don't i didn't even see a word like was there a word right but they've seen now that people who have um who are very experienced meditators they'll see the word that nobody else will see which is exactly what they've been claiming <laughs> since always um and so by no like you know and so you could just that on its own and that's just like one little piece of it but just that on its own like just being able to to perceive things that nobody else will perceive just because it happens so quickly that will open up all sorts of lines of inquiry um uh, allow you to see impermanence in a much more direct way and etc 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 um then the other thing that we can is that's one thing is we can develop these technologies but the other thing that we can do when like when we when there's something that's important to us but is currently very hidden from us is we can first of all establish like we can take we can take a source of somebody who claims to know somebody who says oh i've had direct experience of this or i've deduced this or something we can take such a source we first of all would have to establish them as a valid source as a reliable source right which is something that takes a lot of doing and there's a lot to be said about that um and then we take on the claims of the source as hypotheses until we're able to have a pramana about it one way or the other, right? Until we're able to know for ourselves one way or the other. Um, that's what most of us do most of the time with most things. I, how, how good we are at establishing that a source is reliable, I leave up to you, but... Um, but whether we do that part well or not, most of the things we know, we're just trusting sources that we're implicitly assuming are reliable, you know? I think that's very, very, very clear nowadays because no matter what you believe, I bet you think that half of the people in the world are believing unreliable sources or at least half the people in the United States. Um, like the sheeple who believe that the earth is round just because NASA says so, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, but anyway. Um, so there, there's more I could say, but let me, let me open this up a little bit to, to questions. A lot of what I'm saying, I think could be it could be very theoretical or, or perhaps impractical depending on where we're at and what's uh, what's on our, you know, like what, what has our attention these days. Um, but I, I thought it might be helpful, A, in case this is something that anybody does struggle with, but also B, um, I think it can be helpful to know that this is there so that if someday it becomes important, there, there's a lot there because otherwise I think it's easy to reduce Buddhism. Like we can, we can approach Buddhism the way we would approach a religion, I guess. But um, thoughts, concerns, questions. Yes, please. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by this, um, the way you're talking about phenomena being, you know, on a this continuum from manifest to like very hidden. And I'm wondering if that actually can apply to like um, an individual kind of insight. Like, you know, so, so if somebody cuts me off in traffic and I'm angry. And so that's the manifest. But like, why am I angry? And that like coming up with some sort of answer may be that, well, because I'm running late or what, and doing that kind of investigation where you get to the very hidden and it's like, oh, it's something in my childhood, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. that like you, you didn't even connect it or it was, you know, you didn't, you weren't even aware of it. And so is that like, does it become, does that phenomena and like how you categorize it, is it really levels of consciousness, like the conscious, the subconscious and going maybe down into the unconscious? I was just wondering that, if there's any That's a great kind of question. That's a really, really great question. Well, 
to, to answer your question, honestly, let me, let me just increase my, my uh, specificity a little bit. Um, I, I, so I was explaining this in a, in a slightly looser way by giving the example of how something can go from being one type of phenomenon to another, just like that, you know, uh, and, and listen, and we could, we could use the concepts as I said them to think about things like you just said, which I think could be actually really helpful. Now, when you look at these concepts in the actual tradition, the concepts of manifest slightly hidden and very hidden in the, in the action, the way they're used in the actual tradition, um, the way they actually use it is if something is, is of such a nature that you could directly see it for yourself, even if you're not currently directly seeing it for yourself, then it's, we reckon it as manifest to you, right? If it's of such a nature that you could deduce it, but not see it directly, then we'd reckon it at, well, whether or not you could see it directly, if you could deduce it, then we reckon it as being slightly hidden to you. And if it's such that, you know, with your current you know, body and mind and state of affairs of the world, you just couldn't possibly ever come to know it yet. I'm not, I'm not saying that clearly enough. Like, like, um, like, for example, what does my birthday, what, what does my, what does my birth certificate say my birthday is? Like, what does my birth certificate say my birthday is? That to me in the system would be a manifest phenomenon because even though I don't have my birth certificate in front of me right now, I could go and look. It's feasible, it's doable. So we count it and say, okay, that we call that a manifest phenomenon. Um, is, is my birth certificate more or less than 10 years old that's a slightly hidden phenomenon. You know, I, I, it doesn't say any, like I can't see it, you know, but I can know logically that it's older than 10 years old, right? Now, what day was I actually born? That's a very hidden phenomenon because, um, because short of being able to see the past, there's just nothing I can do. Like there's, no, there's nowhere I can turn. There's nowhere I can go. I can ask my parents, but they could be lying. You know, that's, that's very pessimistic sounding, but you, you, you get more or less what I'm saying, right? So in your example, I would suggest from, from a Buddhist point of view, from a Buddhist point of view, we would say that um, everything in the mind is a manifest phenomenon. It's just that most of the time, most of it, we, we don't, we're not immediately looking at, you know? But we could investigate, but we would investigate. Mm, I'm just, I'm thinking about your specific example. So here's, here's what I would say. What I'm feeling right now is a manifest phenomenon, whether or not I'm aware of it in the moment, because it could turn my attention to it and find out, right? What historical events from my childhood contributed to me feeling this way right now, that would be a hidden phenomenon probably. Right. And if there's anything that might have affected me in my childhood, which there probably is, that I couldn't possibly reason out, that would be a, an extremely hidden phenomenon. But it's not the it's not the thing in the mind itself right now. It's the past. Right. However, and, and this is I want to say all of that because I want to say this next thing. Ready? This next thing is this one very, very, very crucial thing to realize in that situation is that the other driver's intent is a very hidden phenomenon to you, period. Because when we get angry, it's we're angry because the other person did it out of sheer disrespect or out of a sense of entitlement or out of et cetera. And that is just a story we're making up. We have zero way of knowing if that's true or not. And that we have zero way of finding out short of um telepathy short of uh clairvoyance that's what the buddhist that that's what the buddha says and and that is one of the main reasons for studying logic believe it or not is is to become firmly convinced of that and then right there anger tends to it 
Like anytime we think to ourselves, well, I mean, obviously, obviously they only said that because they wanted to blah, blah, blah. Take a step back and open up your logic book. <laughs> and, and, and you'll be reminded that I have no clue. I have no idea. I have no idea. It's, it's kind of shocking. It's kind of shocking. It, it, it kind of like pulls the rug out from under how we live our lives, I think. But I, and I think if, if we're very careful and thoughtful though, I bet we could all of us, if we, really, if we have a good memory at least and, and we're very thoughtful, I bet we could all of us think of examples of when somebody did something that was very, very, very obviously done for one reason. And, and we were really angry and nobody could have talked us out of that. And later we were like, oh, excuse me, oh shit. That wasn't what happened at all. Because we never had a pramana in the first place. We never had a pramana of their intention. We can't, without clairvoyance, we can't. Um, uh, Greg, did you have, did you have your hand up before? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm resting oh. on my, uh, okay. Our, no our problem. Here, no problem. This is, this is amazing stuff. Thank you. I'm, I'm, oh, really I'm so glad a lot here. My, my wife's sitting right here joining the class. Oh, hi. <laughs> so hi. Welcome. She's, she's really enjoying it. So, um, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so but, glad. Yeah, no, no, I'm just resting here. I'm, I'm not, resting. I'm not waxing over philosophical guys. <laughs> no, no. She's no. Uh, she hasn't even heard you before. So this is her first taste and she hasn't oh. left the car yet. <laughs> oh, so. oh my God. Okay. Goof. All right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the most helpful thing I could have heard. Thank you. Um, all right. Other, other thoughts, questions. Yes. Yes, please. Barbara. I just want to clarify so other people's minds are the category of extremely hidden phenomena. Um, the, 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 the existence of other people's minds is a slightly hidden phenomenon. Okay. But what they're thinking in their minds yes. is the extremely hidden phenomenon. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Um, from a Buddhist point of view, this, this is something I, I think is so beautiful and so helpful. Um, what we want to do as Mahayana Buddhists is we want to become Buddhas. Why? So that we can help all beings in the best possible way. Which, and to know how to best help beings, we need we need to know what's in their minds. You know, like not in a voyeuristic, creepy way, but like in a, uh, you know, like we all know how sometimes we say something that we think will be so helpful to somebody and they take it and they either use it to beat themselves up or they take it and use it to beat us up, but nobody's helped. Right. Um, and so to be able to help people, we need to, we need to do something that to us right now is just, it's almost in, inconceivable, which is like, we need to know exactly how anything I might say would impact that person, not just in the moment, but how would it carry over, you know? Because uh, let me give you another one. Like I, I often think about people in my life, whether people who are a big part of my life, but like, especially people who like cross my life for an instant, like the lady at the car rental place, uh, when I went to, you know, when I went to my honeymoon with my husband, you know, like she said something that still stays with me and she'll never know. <laughs> She'll never, ever, ever know, you know, but the Buddha would know. And so the Buddha would know exactly what to say and exactly what to do when to be most helpful to us and to not hurt us. Right. So we need to do that. We need to have that. We need to know um, to be able to be most helpful to people. We need to know exactly how it will impact them. And. And. Um, so so not only okay so not only does that tell us because we can't know that yet we need to become buddhas right so that we can know that but also th this is the best part do you guys know the story about the the chinese farmer from the borderland and the horse this is a classic chinese story it's not a buddhist story you might hear it sometimes referred to as a buddhist story it's it's a taoist story and it goes, I'll try my best. I don't know if I can do it just, but it goes something like this. 
uh, this was in, you know, ancient times in China. And there was this very poor farmer and he and his son, uh, like his, his young adult son, I guess, uh, they would plow the fields themselves. Like they would take the, um, the plow, like, I guess, in their hands and just plow the fields themselves. And, and they had just enough for subsistence. They could just live. And one day, a wild horse just kind of wandered into their farm and just kind of tamely existed there. And so they were able to capture the horse with the prospect of, um, of using the horse to help plow the field. And so all the neighbors came around and all the neighbors said, this is wonderful news. This is what a wonderful, now you'll be rich. Now you'll be this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And the farmer was a very wise man. And he said, maybe, right? And so they went and they invested whatever little money they had on, uh, on a, I've never been on a farm, a plow share adapter. I don't know, like a thing to connect a plow to a horse. And um, and then, so now they, 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 you know, this was a huge investment. They used up their last penny. And so they went to sleep. And then, and overnight the horse ran away. And so the next day, all the neighbors came and they said, oh no, what a tragedy. Now you've lost all of your savings for nothing. It would have been better if the horse had never come. And the farmer is a wise man and he said, maybe. And then the next day, the horse came back and behind the horse came a mare. And the mare only came because the mare was following the horse. And so all the neighbors came and said, Oh my goodness, this is the most amazing thing. What it, it, now you have two horses and if a horse hadn't run away, this wouldn't have happened. What a good thing that the horse came in the first place. And the farmer said, maybe. And then that day, the son sat on the mare to, to start to train the mare. But because the mare was, was not trained yet, the mare kicked, the mare did this and the son fell and broke his leg. And now because the son fell and broke his leg, there would be nobody to train the mare, nobody to, to, um, help the farmer harness the horse. And now the farmer was down to only him being able to plow the field for some time because his son couldn't help him anymore. And so this was, this was going to be fairly disastrous for the family. So all the neighbors came around and said, oh, oh, what a catastrophe. How horrible this is. It would have been better if the horse had never come. And the farmer said, maybe. And then the next day, the emperor of China declared war against the uh, Mongols and declared that all able-bodied young men had to come serve in the war, but it was pretty clear that all the men who went to serve would, would die, you know, it was like high likelihood. But because the son's leg was broken, uh, he, wasn't gonna, he didn't have to go, and so he wouldn't die. And so all the neighbors came around and said, oh, what fortune, what fortune, what a good thing that the horse came in the first place. And the farmer said, maybe. And the story ends there just because we run out of time, right? Now, From a Buddhist point of view, again, this isn't a Buddhist story. From a Buddhist point of view, contrary to what I think the spirit of the story actually is, when all is said and done, <laughs> eons from now, it will either have turned out to have been a good thing that the horse came or a bad thing that the horse came. I think the point of the story is that it's not, but I think from a Buddhist point of view, it's, it's funny because so many people think this is a Buddhist story, but it's not really. Um, you know, who, who knows, like if the son, you know, it, it, because he's lying in his sick bed with a broken leg, if he then takes up some Dharma study and he becomes liberated and enlightened and helps about it, then it, it was wonderful that the horse came, you know, but if because he's lying sick in bed, the son thinks, oh my God, life is so unfair. There's no point. I'm just going to become a murderer. Then it's better that the horse had not come, right? Now, only a Buddha by definition, only an omniscient being by definition can see all of the ramifications or re and repercussions of every single facet of what would happen if this and if that and the other and this and this and that. And then the Buddha will then do whatever will be most helpful to people as long as their karma permits, as long as, 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 to whatever extent they're able to receive it, basically. Like, like physically able, like, you know, like, like literally able, not. Um, and so if, like, if, if a horse comes 
And at first we think it's good, but then the sun falls off the horse and now we think it's bad, right? We might think of the horse as like a bad thing. That horse was a bad thing, you know, ugh, that horse. But maybe the horse was a manifestation of the Buddha, right? Maybe that horse was the Buddha that got us to break our leg so that we wouldn't have to go to war because the Buddha knew that if that happened, then we would lie in bed and then we would study the Dharma and then we'd become enlightened and then we would help all sentient beings. And this is the best thing that could possibly have happened. But maybe not. Maybe the horse was just a horse. And maybe it would have been better if the horse had not come, right? We don't know. And the thing is, because we're not omniscient, we don't have any way of knowing. Because we're not omniscient, we have no way of knowing whether somebody doing something is ultimately for the good or ultimately for the bad. When we're making our decisions, we can only go by the best wisdom we have and the best intention we have. We strive to do what seems to us will be best, and we do that, and that's enough. That's enough. It might turn out to have had negative implications. It might. But we're creating the potentials in our mind to do better and better, to do gooder and gooder, you know, and to be more and more helpful. And we will get there and we will become enlightened and all will be well, right? That's enough. But whether what somebody else did will turn out to have been for the best or will turn out to have been for the worse, we, we can't tell. We can't tell, right? And so it follows from there and, and follow me on this. This is shocking if you haven't heard this before, but it follows from there that it's impossible, impossible to know who and what is a manifestation of Buddha and who and what is not. What about Hitler, I hear you ask? Stop asking me about Hitler, I reply. <laughs> When I first teach you about gravity, don't ask me about hot air, hot air balloons. Wait and ask me that in a little bit, right? That's not the first question. That's like the 10th question, right? Let's think about bowling balls first, right? Gravity bowling balls, they fall. Yes, yes. Okay, let's take it one step at a time. All right. So before we get to Hitler, let's talk about, let's talk about your coworker who's nasty to you sometimes but who probably doesn't really mean ill, right? There's no way of knowing that they're not Buddha. We can't even begin to guess what their purpose might be, right? Their status as Buddha or not is an extremely hidden phenomenon. Their motivation is an extremely hidden phenomenon. If, if you get nothing from Buddhism but this, I think your life can change and for the drastically better, right? Now, between here and Hitler, let's take an intermediary step. Well, so what if the person is saying to me that they're plotting murder? I don't know if they're Buddha. So should I just say, oh, well, you know, I hope that murder is helpful to sentient beings? No, don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Do whatever you would do if you didn't, if I hadn't said anything. Like, would you call the police and call the police? Like, would you hold them down and prevent them and hold them down and prevent them? Why? Not because what I'm saying is just nice in theory, but it's not nice in practice. Not because of that. But because when I say that we don't know what the, what the Buddha's intention would be, I really mean that all the way down, you know? For all I know, the Buddha is manifesting, telling you that they're going to commit murder so you, can so you can accumulate the positive karma of preventing murder. You know, like, don't, don't take what I'm saying and like memorize that. Don't say like, oh, maybe it's because of the karma of preventing murder. That's not the point at all. The point is, it doesn't help to know that something might be Buddha in terms of deciding what to do. It, it, it's, it, it cancels itself out. Anything could be Buddha anywhere. So it, it doesn't mean like then just, you know, lean back and do nothing. Anything could be Buddha, you know? Um, therefore, but, but definitely one thing we can know is that the Buddha wants us to do the best we can with what wisdom we have. And so if the, if the Buddha is, is, Buddha could very well be manifesting 
as, as something so that we can take the initiative of protecting others, so that we can take the initiative of protecting ourselves. We don't know. We don't know, right? If the Buddha has a plan, you can't foil the plan. You know, the Buddha knows exactly all the repercussions. So it's, don't worry about that. So if, so, so this is important. This has no bearing on what should we therefore do. This has every bearing on what should we therefore think, which is different. So instead of calling the police and having the person go to prison with the thought, good, I hope that evil bastard rots in prison and is miserable. We can call the police and have the person go to prison with the thought, I'm so glad that I prevented people from getting hurt. And if that being is a Buddha, I'm so grateful that they gave me this opportunity. And if that being is not a Buddha, then I really hope that they can turn their life around and turn their mind around and uh, regret what they were about to do and develop compassion and loving kindness as quickly as possible. What do you guys think? And I think we, I think what tends to make this difficult for us is that we, we all tend to make a mistake. I don't know if this is universal or if this is a Western thing, but certainly in the West, it's universal. Then we make this very weird mistake, but we all do, which is that thinking that if we don't judge people, then we won't be able to take effective action. And it's just, that's just a made up sentence, <laughs> you know? Um, but if I don't know what their intentions really are, really, then I won't know what to do. That's not true. If somebody's going around with a machete, like killing people left and right, you know what to do. It doesn't really matter what their intentions are, not much. The, the only thing that matters is, do they know something I don't? That's a different type of question. You know, do they know something I don't? That's different. That, that, that's not something, gosh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm painting myself into a corner here. I'm like having to say more and more. Um, the Buddha being omniscient knows something we don't. But if the Buddha is manifesting as a horse that kicks us off its back, the horse doesn't know something we don't. All right, I'll, I won't say any more about that unless you guys ask questions about that. Otherwise, otherwise we'll be here forever. But, um, but, but the bottom line is what to do is always the same. Using whatever wisdom you have, using whatever positive motiv motivation you can muster, do what seems to you like will be best, always. You can't, don't second guess your wisdom. Don't second guess, oh, but what if secretly something that I can't possibly know. Like, don't, don't, don't second guess your wisdom when it comes to uh, extremely hidden phenomena, I guess is what I'm really saying. You have, we have to rule out the extremely hidden phenomenon when we're making these types of decisions because it could be this, but it could be the opposite of this. So, so again, in terms of what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> That's important too. What do I do? The answer is with your best wisdom and your best motivation, do what seems to be best. That's that's the only thing that has no exceptions in Buddhism, I think. Um, now, in terms of how do I judge that person, the easy answer that I guess that's all probably also an exception. Like the easy answer is, oh, don't, don't. You won't benefit from it. They won't benefit from it. Nobody will benefit from it. And, um, and, and you can be very harmed by it. They can't really, they won't be affected one way or they'll be affected by what you do, not by how you secretly judge them, you know, uh, but you'll be affected by how you secretly judge them. And the Buddha said, the, to, the Buddha emphasized this point so much that he said, before you can judge somebody, you need to have, I forget if he said five or seven, let's, let's say five. You need to have five perfect, logical deductive inferences five pramanas then judge them 
Otherwise, he says, you will fall. That was that's what the Buddha said. Otherwise, you will fall. And um, you'll never find one brahmana if you're not clairvoyant, let alone five. You know, so you don't need to judge. And as, as we say in, in dialectical behavior therapy, and when you do judge, don't judge yourself for judging. You know, just notice and say, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, that's the habit, isn't it? I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts about this. Yes. That's exactly what I was just going to talk to you about is, you know, our, our nature. It, it is our nature um, to have those. We're just conditioned to have those human reaction, reactions and judgments. So um, I hear what you're saying and I, I counter, I have counter judgments against myself. And you just said, you know, don't do that. Um, but um, what do you do when, when those, those, you know, you see something, that judgment comes into your head from conditioning? Um, yeah. I know I'm, I'm immediately working on it when it happens, but is there a, a strategy yeah. that you use when, sure. when you find that happening? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. For, first, I want to be super pedantic, but with a reason and, and, and uh, tweak something you said. You said two statements. The first one was false and the second was true. You said it's our nature to do this. And then you said we're conditioned to do this. Yes, I changed it on purpose. Good. Okay. You were correcting my yourself. Nature. My All true right. nature is not that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not like it's our, our nature is, is it like at the very, very least, our nature is indifferent to that. You know, um, if you have a nice sculpture of, I don't know, of Billy Joel, why not? Um, it's not the nature of the water to be shaped like Billy Joel. It's just a momentary condition, right? So yes, our minds currently are very much conditioned to, to leap to judgments. Uh, but thankfully, thankfully, that's not innate. Um, and the, the answer to that question, I'll, I'll give you a few little pieces. The first piece is... Um, learning learning the 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 logic that establishes this really well and becoming very clear i remember for me there was a moment like i was reading a book on logic and there was a moment like i was in the subway i felt like the penny dropped it was like up until that moment it's it just seemed like advice it seemed like there was something about it that to be totally honest felt a little touchy feely like oh we shouldn't judge people i i, I don't know like it seem that way to me at least on some level like it made more and more sense but and then there was a moment when the penny dropped and i was like oh oh like i really actually have no idea like i've been fabricating all of this for real it's not even like you i might have been wrong it's like i've just been making this up i'm just living in a world of stories that i'm making up that helped tremendously that helped tremendously. Um, then the second thing would be, if you can do that first thing, then to, um, then to, when the judgments come, to, to practice, again, I think as Benavar Rubina says, I think fake it till you make it, you know, like speak to yourself as if you were being gentle, even if you're not feeling gentle at first and, and say gently to yourself, val validate yourself first and say, I mean, of course, like it's not, this isn't a me thing. This is a human being thing. And, and the mind, mind as well as all other human beings has been rehearsing that for countless eons. Um, when I was, when I was um, in college, I worked at the Office of Academic Student Affairs and First Year Services. And the reason I can say that is because every time we answer the phone, we had to say, good morning or good afternoon, Office of Academic, wait, oh my God, now I can't, Office of Academic, I just said it, I am making a point and now, and now, now I'm, I'm, I'm jinxing myself. Good afternoon, Office of Academic Students, okay. Whatever I just said, I, I, God, okay. My, my point broke is destroyed. My, thank you. This is the <laughs> moment I needed. This is the moment I needed. Uh, Office of Student Affairs and first, first, and first year, sorry, whatever. Wow, this is interesting. First time. All right. 
uh, academic student affairs and first year services, academic student affairs and first year. Now, now I have to rehearse it again. Um, and so for, for four years, that's what I'd say when I answer the phone. And then I graduated and I started working with some publications. And I, I, sometimes I had to answer the phone. And when the phone would ring, what would I say? Of course, you know, Office of Academic Student Affairs in first years. I, I'm so sorry. I mean, wisdom publications, how can I help? Right? It, it's conditioning. It's natural. Um, so, so again, so when it comes up, first validate yourself and normalize it, you know, which are two, two close but different things. And and then, and then practice remembering that logic that you'd already learned. It's it, like, just apply it to this situation and think, it, it absolutely seems to me right now that I can tell what this person is thinking or feeling or whatever. Why is it again that I think that I can't, you know? And, th and that's meditation, by the way, that's accustomation. That's what it is right? Like this is how we change. So, so this is actually following that same thing. So first you need to understand the hypothesis, make sure that you're in the hypothesis here is some, here I am claiming to you, you can't know what other people are thinking or why they do the things they do. Like make sure that you're understanding my hypothesis clearly. Then look at the reasoning, investigate it until that penny drops. When the penny drops, you'll you'll kind of almost like see for yourself, like, oh my God, I really I can't. You know, that crazy man was right. I can't, you know. Then you have to accustomate, habituate, meditate, right? And you can do that by sitting on the cushion and doing it, which can give you a huge boost. You can like meditate on that that visceral feeling of the recognition that you don't know what other people are thinking that will help carry over. But I would say even more importantly is during the day, as it comes up, you meditate then, meaning you remind yourself then and you apply it to this situation, right? Uh, you do that and you give yourself, I'm actually going to say give yourself four more things. You, if you have a purification practice, bring this into the purification practice, you know, use the four opponent powers if you're familiar with them for all of the imprints that you've created for judging right? Then accumulate positive potential, which means when you do something positive, you dedicate the positive potential to, you know, among other things, may this help me, uh, help my mind let go of judging. Then uh, inspiration, you know, find people who you, if, if you have a, a real, if you have like a heart connection with the teacher, then use that with one or more teacher, whatever. But failing that, at least see if you can find somebody who you think it, it really makes you believe that it's possible. Um, and I'm going to add a fourth one here, which is, well, it's a twofold one, which is time and patience. You know, if you have all of those ingredients, it's, it, they're, then it's guaranteed. It's, it's absolutely guaranteed. It will stop. It will change. There's no way it could not. I like the last one. Yeah, me too. I was about to say, actually, I was about to say, like, I yeah, haven't heard remember it. that one makes it a lot easier to be kind to myself. And yeah. Myself when yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to write this down because I think this is actually, this is actually an important thing to, to say out loud. Uh, fifth thing needed for the mind to change. Patience. Because um, the list is traditionally given as just the other four. Um, but logically speaking, like you could have all four, but if you don't have the fifth, then there's not going to be change. So maybe there are five things. Um, other? Thoughts, questions, concerns. Chelsea has one. Of course. Hi. Hi. Um, hopefully I can articulate this, but what I'm curious about is I think there's maybe some, and maybe less so these days in recent modern humanity, but I would think judgment or like discernment to a certain degree 
at least at times or is like or could be beneficial maybe right yes so yes yes excess or you know or whatever from a dangerous situation or choosing to do something you know based make on a judgment yes so how do you kind of reconcile like I guess maybe good judgment versus bad judgment. Is yes. it when we're looking, trying to guess someone's intentions? Is that kind of the difference? Yes, or yes, kind of, uh... yes. Oh, I'm so glad. That's a great question, a very important question. I'm really glad you asked. Um, discernment, discernment is not only not a bad thing, but it's absolutely essential and crucial in Buddhism as well as in life. I mean, you know, like it's, yeah. Um, and, and if we like, let's take what you're saying, let's even take it to what I would maybe for now, at least say it's like the most extreme type of that, which would just be like an intuition, you know, just like having a bad feeling about somebody, let's say, right. Um, what I would say is all else being equal, follow that feeling in terms of your actions, that, that it comes back to that same point. It, it's, do let that affect do, do let that inform your actions yes so what are we saying here is is unper, counterproductive to to let it inform is your judgment in the sense of like let's say like this is a good person this is a bad person this is a worthwhile person or an unworthwhile person um and even look in practice in practice, I'm not even saying we need to go to the extent of if there's somebody who seems to always be angry all the time. In practice, I'm not even saying we need to go to the extent of saying like, of like, oh, I mustn't say they're angry all the time. I don't know. They could be pretending. But it can be helpful if at the very least in some prominent corner of our mind, we remember that in our heart of hearts, you know, like they, they appear to me to always be angry is more accurate. You know what I mean? Stay away from them might be good advice. <laughs> like that's something to do. <laughs> Report them to HR might be very important advice. That's again, something to do, <laughs> you know, because they're angry already gets very, very, I mean, technically we don't know that, you know, that, that like, if we can let go of that, that's amazing. But then because they're actually a horrible person that we should certainly <laughs> does that help yeah no it's definitely it really does let yeah. it inform your actions That's and not your beautiful. judgments then. exactly she actually works in employee relations too by HR. The way, so oh <laughs> no am i am i saying anything wrong <laughs> no it's great it's perfect oh, okay <laughs> thank you thank you of course um it's, um, again, I, it comes back to what I think is a fundamental mistake that we make and so interesting about. It's, it's funny because I, I think it's innate to us. I don't think it's something that we were taught necessarily. You know, it, it's, it's innate, to, innate is too strong a word. It's, it's, um, it's like inborn to us in this life at least. But, um, but we don't make that same mistake about other things. Like, for example, well, let me actually put it this way. To know that this person often screams at people is a good enough reason, in some cases, to tell people to avoid them. You know, we don't need furthermore to believe that, that you know, that secretly and unbeknownst to us, they also cast magic spells and anything like the, the, it's not necessary similarly similarly knowing that this person often yells at people is in some cases good enough reason to warn people to stay away from them we don't need to furthermore seek believe that secretly they're also angry in their heart that's irrelevant to the question really you know and we know that when it comes to other things we we know that let's say if we have a headache aspirin helps the headache that's a good enough reason to take the aspirin we don't need to furthermore believe that secretly and unbeknownst to us aspirin might contain the secret to immortality if taken on tuesday you know like that's maybe maybe not it doesn't matter that's not the point you know, we don't need to know something about the intention of the person who first made the aspirin it doesn't matter you know um 
So recognizing this fundamental mistake we make and learning to let go of it. Because I remember when I first, when I was first like really looking at this, I was very worried that if I really came to believe that, if I really came to believe that I didn't know people's motivations, then I would, um, I would just stop doing what needs to be done. But what's interesting is that if anything, the opposite has happened. It, it's, it, it's amazing how much space it frees up in the mind, how much energy, at least for me, maybe I was an extremely judgmental person more so than the average, I don't know, but like, it's just freed up so much energy. Like the, the time that, so much time that would be spent on how could they and I can't believe this and I can't believe that and evidently this and do you think that that no maybe yes but maybe not but the, like all of that time now is instead spent on oh okay so what should I do <laughs> and then doing it <laughs> there's there are more there are literally more hours in the day <laughs> for me maybe I was a very judgmental person <laughs> um in the in the last couple of minutes that we have, any other thoughts, questions? Yes, of course, please. I don't know how on point this is to the topic, but something that I've been thinking about a lot is is heart, our heart. Open our heart. I feel it in my heart. From the Buddhist perspective, what what is is that? interchangeable with mind because when we separate from this body my heart stays mm. if i have a heart transplant my heart do you know what i'm asking yes I don't yes okay. yes 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 absolutely absolutely uh I'm, I'm not sure if i'm able to relate this back to the same topics from before i don't mind at all i think it's a great question anyway and um and, and, and let me start by admitting that I don't know, like if I wanted to answer your question very, very, very literally, I don't know how the, whatever the equivalent word in like Pali and Sanskrit and Tibetan for heart is and how they would use that. So that I can't speak to, right? But I can, I can speak to my understanding of Buddhism and my understanding of the English word heart, right? So from that perspective, certainly we would say we have our physical heart and that is just a physical thing. It's just like the foot or anything else. It has its own functions for the body, but it's, it's no different from anything else. Um, we could then also say that when we say heart, if we're Tibetan Buddhists, we could be talking about something in the subtle nervous system, which is a whole topic that, we, that two minutes won't give us enough time to cover in adequate detail. But uh, it's something that has to do with what sometimes you might call like, um, um, you, you'll see words like channels and chakras and things like that. And again, these words can be misleading, but, right? And that refers, and so there, there is a piece of that, that because of its proximity to the organ of the heart, even though it's not exactly in the same place, but because of its proximity, often will get uh, referred to as heart also. That is also a physical thing. <laughs> you know, it's more subtle, but it's also a physical thing. And that also doesn't um, continue from one lifetime to the next, you know. It, now, that gets a little bit more like that. On that level, it does get a little bit more juicy, I guess, because um, there, there does exist in the same, the, so the brain, the brain is a physical thing. You know, the brain doesn't continue from one life to the other, but we all know that what happens in the brain has a it very closely, uh, affects what happens in the mind and vice versa. Right. Um, and what happens in the, in the heart chakra, let's call it also very closely affects the mind and vice versa. You know, it's something that in the West, Bud Buddhism has a lot more to say about it than Western science does at present. Like in the West, we know a few things about it. I think like 
how um, people, when they have heart attacks, they can become extremely depressed in ways that seem to go above and beyond just the fact that something, you know, like some equivalent thing happening somewhere else in the body doesn't seem to have that effect. Like that, there's different things that, that we know about that. And we, of course, we know how uh, when we're anxious or something like that, our physical heart pumps and et cetera. But there's a lot more that can be said for that. For that reason, when a, when a Tibetan says my mind, they point like this, they don't point like that, you know? It's, it's, it's metaphorical. It's not making some, it's not making some deep truth statement or anything like that. You know, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, it's not true that the mind is located in the head. It's not true that the mind is located in the chest, you know, but there are physical correlates here. There are physical correlates here. There are physical correlates throughout our bodies. And so culturally we go like this, they go like that. Right. Now, I, I, I think all of that is, I wanted to say all of that to kind of clear away some potential misunderstandings, but I think the positive answer to your question is that in English, when we say heart, we, we're usually referring to, to something that within Buddhism would be mind. There's no doubt of that. But we're usually referring to some parts of it, but not to others. You know, like, um, like we wouldn't say, you know, if somebody said, how, how did you do this mathematical calculation? We, would, we could say, oh, I just did it in my mind. We wouldn't say, I just did it in my heart, right? But, um, but if, if somebody says, how do you know this? We would say, I feel it in my heart. We wouldn't, we wouldn't say, I feel it in my mind, right? So it, it's a, it's a, given that we have zero minutes, what I'll say is, what I'll say is, I'll, I'll say it's, it's a, it's an open question that each of us can investigate for ourselves. What aspects of the mind in English do we refer to as heart? And what aspects do we not? You know, things that are more intellectual that are about calculation and about assessment, you know, and things like that. We don't tend to say heart when we mean those. Things that are more uh, felt as immediate experiences, we tend to say heart, you know, and we can just check just out of almost if curiosity, if nothing else, right? Um, but ultimately, both of those things fall squarely within what Buddhism is talking about when Buddhism says mind, right? And and I'll, I'll just share one last thing, which is for, for several years, I would, I consciously wouldn't say heart when I when I meant mind, you know, because I thought like, oh, I don't want to be confusing, blah, blah. I've given up on that. I realized that that was just creating less communication. You know, like I've come around to say to people like, yeah, I, I know you, you believe that intellectually, but what do you believe in your heart of hearts? You know, but that's just a turn of phrase. You know what I mean? It's just a turn of phrase to convey what I'm getting at. Let's put it that way. Given that we have negative one minute, is that a fair enough? Super helpful. Oh, good. Super, super helpful. Thank oh, you so, so glad. Oh, so glad. Yes. You, oh, you're welcome. Wow. If anybody were being was saying, just like that, just like a dream, our time is up, right? It's uh, amazing. Amazing how fast it went. Um, I had such a wonderful time with you guys this month. I, I so appreciate all of you. It's truly wonderful. Really, really made my month that much lovelier and I thank you very much for it and um yeah and and so let's let's dedicate let's dedicate let's think about um every every movement of the mind every movement of the attention of the intention that happened in this space of time that we've been together it will have repercussions in our future in terms of our experiences, in terms of our uh, urges, in terms of things like that. And so we think that this is, this is the time to accumulate those positive potentials to have what we want to happen happen and us changing our minds. So may these imprints um, lead only to experiences and urges that will help us change our minds in the way we want our minds to change. 
so may if we if this if this is what we want then may it help us change our minds so that we can more and more naturally let go of judgments in the first place so that we can become more and more patient with ourselves so that we can become more and more patient with others so that we can see things more and more clearly feel more and more connected um whatever you want but for, you know just to speak in a general way i'll say maybe so that we can develop more and more true compassionate loving motivation to be of best possible help to all and so that we may develop more and more clarity and wisdom about how things work how things are how things exist in a correct way what will be most helpful so that we can accomplish our goal of becoming buddhas if that's what we want to do so that we can bring all universal sentient beings to the perfect bliss and contentment of enlightenment Wow, what more could we ask for? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, as a Buddhist, I believe we're definitely going to see each other again. So hopefully we'll even be in this life. How about that? All right. Thank you, thank you, Gus. And please come back and teach us again. Oh, really thank you. It. Thank Tomorrow. you so much.